Welcome to College Football Addiction, talking a little bit about the world's largest outdoor cocktail party or the Florida Georgia game. If you're talking with Allie, um, if we, we had Graham coffee on from dog central and he named it the other, he, he yeah. called it the other way. That's a, that's a big point of contention. I feel like it is. That's something we, if you're from the state of Florida, it is Florida, Georgia, and it's the other way around. If you're from the beach state. So as somebody who doesn't really care, like, but I, I do agree with that. I've never called it Georgia, Florida in my life, but I, I live in the state of Florida. Like, but I, you know, I don't have a team in this, but still it. Cause you live in the state of Florida. Yeah. It rolls off the tongue better that way. Um, also, I'm glad we're at a place where you can still call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Do you remember when they took that away or what? Like was something said? The university presidents decided that there was too much focus on alcohol. So they weren't going to call it that. And basically no one listened is what it is. Yeah. So the branding may have changed because it did used to say world's largest outdoor cocktail party on like your ticket, your paper ticket wow. that you got. And it used to say that on like the banners outside the stadium. And now it doesn't. But like everybody calls it the cocktail party that didn't that it changed nothing outside of some signage. Yeah. People, um, yeah, well, I, never mind. I'll just, I'll just move on. Just people that suck, like try to ruin our sport and it, it's right. brutal. So, um, do you I, quickly, and then we'll talk about this game favorite memory in this one. I know you talked about it a little bit on your channel too last night. You but know, and I felt bad that I forgot this memory. Um, but my husband, Eric had a fake punt in the Florida, Georgia game of, I want to say our senior year when he, the year that they ended up winning the national title, he ran for 20 yards. And in the post game press conference, Urban Meyer called it the slowest 20 yards in college football, <laughs> um, which Eric was pissed about because he ran a four, four at a pro day. So he's like, I'm not slow. And I'm pretty sure it's been 20 years and we're still not over it. But, um, and after they won that game, he did climb up on the wall in front of the band and conduct them. But I guess I should give props to the fact that, uh, he did run 20 yards. <laughs> Got um, before we get into the game, what has gone right for UF since their bye week? I mean, you know, I know kind of kind of everything. I, I know the Tennessee game didn't go the way they wanted, but like, what what has changed? What's been the big difference there? Um, I think their defense is being called a lot more aggressively. Um, I think their front seven have played much better and with some fire and some purpose, something that we weren't seeing the first couple of games. Um, I think Florida's linebackers have probably been the most solid unit through the entire season. Um, we've seen some good flashes, um, uh, in, in the secondary as well. I would say they're probably still the worst unit on defense. And then I think DJ Lagway has been phenomenal and I, I hate what happened to Graham Mertz. I think Graham Mertz is a leader on this team and you never want to see anybody get injured. Um, and I think he had a, a higher floor than DJ Lagway did, but I think DJ Lagway is an ESPN top 10 moment waiting to happen, you know, at any given second. And I think that he kind of challenges coach Napier to let him go downfield a little bit, take the reins off a little bit. And we've seen a lot of success there. So the, I want to talk about Lagway more in a moment too, but the transit of property says that UF has played Kentucky and Mississippi state better than UGA did. So <laughs> thoughts on maybe this game being, more even than people think, or you think you know, that, you know, want to back off from that and say that, that maybe matchups matter too, or just thoughts there? Well, matchups do matter, and but it's a rivalry game. And I think, you know, you know, just as well as I do, that a lot of times you can throw records out the window at a rivalry game. It kind of, it means more. It's just a different atmosphere, different vibe. Um, and I think even last year, Florida played Georgia. We were we watched this game together. Florida played Georgia very closely in the first half last year. I think they just didn't have the horses to contend for four quarters, and that's where you kind of saw it fall apart a little bit towards the end. But I don't think it felt as big a blowout as the score looked last year. And I, you know, I expect that Florida is going to put up points. Now, has Florida's defense really improved, or did we just play worse? offenses since the first bye week you know we're gonna find out very quickly on Saturday but I think there is some things you can watch on tape from previous Georgia games and glean some things from right Kentucky 13 to 12 is what Georgia beat them by like is there something in that film that you can replicate you think about the first half of the Alabama Georgia game Carson Beck looked terrified and he made mistake after mistake can you force him into a situation like that. Now, I, you know, Florida's D-line, 
has not been good the majority of the season. They've looked much better the last couple of weeks. I don't know if I think they can look the same against Georgia's offensive line, but you're going to have to have some success there if you're going to get a win. But I think there's a pathway. I, I, I mean, it's pretty narrow, but it exists. Yeah. Um, on Lagway specifically, we talked about him a little bit. Um, he's been really good down the field, not as good, just intermediate to, to short passing. Um, I would assume now I'm not the, the film breakdown guy, but I would assume that has to do more with just reading defenses. Like you don't necessarily read a deep, a defense when you're just throwing a go route and your right. guys are outrunning everybody. And so that, to me, that's a concern. That's, that's kind of a thought in this game is, um, if Georgia, if Georgia takes away that deep ball, which after watching Kentucky, if they don't, I seriously question their, their coaches. Like, what, what do you do? Like, did you, did you see how he killed them time after time after time? Yeah. Um, so that, that's a thought to me is like, how will he match up against the best defense that he will have seen all year? Yeah. Um, and, and will, will Napier try and lean on the run, which Florida's got a really good stable of running backs. Another offensive line is, you know, how, again, how do they match up with UGA's defensive line? Nobody just runs the ball down Georgia's throat, but teams actually have had success and, and have run fairly well. And so I kind of wonder, I mean, he, he's not going to be able to like, um, go conservative and win this game. Like they got to go for it if, if they want to try and win this game, but will he lean on the run some early? Because I do worry about DJ reading that defense in that short to intermediate game. I think that, you know, you're going to see freshman mistakes from DJ Lagway, and that's not a knock on him at all. He is a true freshman cutting his teeth in the toughest conference in the country with the toughest schedule in the country. Um, and I think that Napier's tendencies are to always play conservatively. But I think if Florida has a shot, you're exactly right. They've kind of got to go balls to the walls, right? But I think Jaden Ball brings um, – some versatility to the running back position. I think he also has really good hands. He's somebody you could look to out of the flats. Um, and he has found success against every defense that he's run against this entire season. And now he's just getting a little bit more of the carries because Montrell has been hurt. Um, but, you know, I personally, I hope they open it up right away and see what can happen. Can you, can you score points? Florida has really struggled with scoring in the red zone. And we saw that in the Tennessee game, right? If they get to the red zone, they cannot walk away with zero points. No. They have got to take what they can get because that defense is more than likely going to be stingy. You, know, you talked about that game we had last year. I thought neighbors scripted up the first half, you know, fairly well. You know, everybody gets mad at the fourth down call that um, – there were some choice words being said in your house at that moment, but uh, yeah, like I, I do. I, I think he can script some stuff up early. It's just kind of like, can, can they continue to sustain good it? with halftime adjustments? And I think no. be smart might be best in the country at halftime adjustments. Think about the halftime of that Alabama, Georgia game, you know, and then what we saw after that. Right. I think that he's incredibly good at making those adjustments. I would not say the same thing about the coach Napier, but the last couple of weeks, Florida has looked different. You know, they yeah. have they've kept their foot on the gas more. They've scored a boatload of points. And so maybe his philosophy there has changed a little bit. I don't I don't know. But you have got to be on your coaching a game to have a shot against Kirby Smart. Maybe just take the first half script and start that in the third quarter. Just right? play <laughs> um, outside of ball, outside of lagway. Give me an X factor in this game for UF. Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to say Pup Howard. I think if he has a good game, I think he's probably been the single most consistent player for Florida's defense this season. Really, really good pickup in the offseason transfer portal from South Carolina. Um, I think if he has a big day, that means good things for the Gators. So this is another fun one, I think. At least it was fun to, to put it together and think about it. But uh, the ETN effect. Obviously, Florida's RB1 from last year. Uh, transfers to Georgia. Napier downplayed this, which is the yeah. right thing for a coach to do. No one in that locker room is downplaying this. In yeah. fact, I'm sure Napier is not downplaying it to his team. Um, so I think that's fun. I think that's yeah. going to be a fun thing. I could see both Kirby being petty and trying to get ET in like three touchdowns. And I could see UF's guys being, having a little extra oomph in their, uh, in their tackles. Yeah. You know, I think, um, 
I mean, I guess you're right that what Napier said publicly is probably the right thing. What you don't want to do is give bulletin board material to a team that is already more talented on paper than you are. Um, But I hope that they're using it in the locker room. I hope, you know, what he said publicly was essentially, this isn't the first, this won't be the last time that this happens. And this is pretty common in this day and age. I hope that's not what he says behind closed doors. I hope what he says behind closed doors is this is our very own Benedict Arnold. Let's, you know, let's take him out kind of thing. Um, And I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean take him out. Not going bounty gate, right? Like not going to do it. I just mean (laughs) beat him, you know, show him what he's missing out on. Um, And I think Brandon Spikes, being in that locker room. And, you know, if I'm Napier, I am showing that highlight of Brandon Smikes laying on top of no Sean Moreno and just barking in his face. I'm showing that on a loop, you know, in the practice facility all week long, you're supposed to hate your rivals, right? Urban Meyer did that better than pretty much anybody. Steve Spurrier, excellent at it. Dan Mullen, pretty darn good at it. Napier has has not been great in stoking those flames, kind of. And I think that's part of the fun of college football. That's that's part of being a Florida Gator, right, is being passionate about some of those rivalries. And this is one of them. And he did. He quit on you. And he joined your, your opposition, right? Um, and I think that you should want to make him pay for that. So my thoughts on UGA, I, I don't really feel like they've put a full, full game together. I think in the Texas game, they got up big and kind of just pulled their foot off the gas. And, you know, you mentioned the Bama game. They, you know, had no shot and then found a way to come all the way back and had a really good second half. But I do think that's interesting, too, is is if UGA puts a full game together, they're probably unbeatable by anyone in the country. But uh, if they don't, they they leave the door open. And, and Florida has looked really good at times this year. And obviously they've looked you know pretty poor at times early in the year. But um, I think that's probably a confidence that uh, that Florida can have is, you know, th- these guys have not put together 60 minutes and, and that's, you know, certainly going to be a benefit if, if they don't on Saturday. Um, I want to ask you this. And I know you went further into it on, on your channel, so we'll link that at the end. But uh, how does this game potentially impact Napier's job just from a 30,000 foot overview? You know, I think losing it doesn't isn't the final nail in the coffin, in my opinion. You know, this is when we look at this schedule, this is the hardest or the second hardest team that Florida will play this season. So if you thought Florida had more than likely no shot in it, I don't think it's fair for that to be the final nail in the coffin for him either. But the flip side of that is I do think a win in this game potentially saves his job, right? If you can beat Georgia, you sure as heck should beat Florida State at the end of your schedule. That gets you six wins, which I have said since the summer was probably the bare minimum acceptable number of wins with this schedule. And I'm not saying acceptable in that like Gator fans are going to be happy about it, but acceptable in that we get a year four out of him. Um, But if you can beat Georgia, winning begets winning, right? You you're kind of on a roll at that point. If you can beat Georgia, there's no reason you can't beat LSU and Ole Miss. And it could start Florida on a really positive path. Allie, I hear you're interviewing a couple of pretty massive coaches that coached in this game with Mark Richt and uh, Urban Meyer coming on the channel this week. Something that I don't know if anybody else will really kind of have the advantage or benefit of doing that. Where can people find those this week and follow more of your work? Yeah, I mean, if you come over to YouTube and search for a peek inside Gator football, pretty excited about it. I think we're going to talk a lot about... Uh, you know, those 2007, 2008 years were really, really heated. And uh, I kind of want to get both sides of that. Awesome. Go check it out. We'll link it in the description. Allie, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having me.